I'm Richard Osgood. I'm the senior archaeologist that works for the Defence Infrastructure Organisation, part of the Ministry of Defence. And this is a project we've been working on since 2011. These are the latest three weeks called Operation Nightingale, which we use archaeology to aid and assist the recovery of military personnel who've been in operational theatres. We've done a series of sites, they can range from prehistoric elements to the early medieval up to those of the First and Second World Wars. There's a heritage angle to all of these things and I think the connection is people. It's people in the past and that's what engages the people of the present. Um, to ask them why do you like this sort of thing, you get different answers for most of them. I think working in part of a team, I think that's a really crucial thing because they've done that in their military careers and in many cases that's stopped quite abruptly. But then bringing them back in a military environment, although a safe location, with landscapes they've appreciated in the past, or maybe not appreciated in some of the worst bits of training. Um, that's an important thing, but then they can use physical skills, they can use their own mental skills. Perhaps they've not realised they've had these capacities, but this excavation will highlight that they have got elements that they can bring to bear on their, their, their life and their, their own career paths after the military, which I think is important. On some of the sites we found just being around a campfire, sitting with a few beers in the evening and, and talking about things with, a, with an environment with people that are uh, understanding of your situations, they've been through the same sort of element as well. I think it's many and varied. I think actually COVID has also made it quite important to be in an open space because for many of us we've been cooped up for an awful long time so just to be able to be in somewhere as beautiful as this amongst friends is wonderful for the well-being and that's not just for the, the military personnel, it's for the archaeologists and the civilians as well. So I think it can bring in all sorts of things. Archaeology has a job for everybody and it's their, their, their role is to find what they particularly like and, and make the most of it. We're standing in a really rich archaeological landscape, Salisbury Plain, everywhere you put a spade effectively has got archaeology in it and this is no exception. It was found in the first instance by Wessex Archaeology who undertook an evaluation here prior to what might have been the Royal Artillery Museum coming later on. As things stand we're probably not going to have that museum but there's still an awful lot of archaeology that we felt within MOD should be looked at in greater depth. So that's what we've got behind us. Turns out We've got a 7th century cemetery, which is a fascinating piece of archaeology. It engages our personnel and actually gives us some quite interesting finds at the same time. So for us, we're like just going to focus between there and up here. My name is Jacqueline McKinley, I'm the Principal Osteoarchaeologist at Wessex Archaeology and I'm out here working with the Operation Nightingale on this fantastic site here on Salisbury Plain with a marvellous, marvellous view shed and actually that view shed is probably why this is here, that massive view over such a large area is why they have chosen this in the Anglo-Saxon period to put one of their cemeteries here. Now I'm, I'm sorry I'm squinting a bit because it is a very very hot sunny day and we've all been getting overheated especially with this chalk because you haven't just got it coming from above you it's bouncing up from underneath as well. But we're working with Operation Nightingale which works with veterans, volunteer veterans who come up here to do something different, get a different experience and actually you know dealing with human remains is quite important because it grounds you and the, the, the guy who runs this, he, he runs something called Breaking Ground. And in many ways, this does ground people. It gets them back to the basics of human life and human death. We've got about 20 graves, as I said. Well, there are actually 22, but two of them we're not digging at the moment. We've done 22. We've got some that are in rows down this end of the site. And then there's some more spaced out around the edges. But in the middle, you can see there's a round circular feature. Now that's an Anglo-Saxon barrow. They're not that common, aren't the Anglo-Saxon barrows? Particularly ones of that size. And the grave in the middle is really, really big. There weren't many grave, there weren't any grave goods in there, but that guy didn't need grave goods because he'd got a great big barrow that showed how important he was. We've got a real mix of population as far as the human remains are concerned. So we've got probably the youngest is about um, four or five years of age. And then we have got adults up to, well, but certainly well over my age, and I'm quite old now. So we're talking about sort of over 50, um, possibly going up to 60 or 70 years of age. And we've got some young adults. We've got young adults. We've got both sexes. So we've got both males and females in here. Um, there are not a lot of grave goods, in fact. We have got, um, I think two of the graves had bone combs in them. In both cases, they were set across the individual's stomach. 
And there's evidence to suggest that there was, there was what we call a purse mount. That's a sort of metal mount that if you think about your granny's handbag, you used to have a snap top on it. Well, it's that kind of thing. So you've got this purse mount and um, it looks like there were bags that had materials in them. So a bone comb and a spindle whirl made from the head of a cattle femur. So that's for drop, drop spinning. Um, the combs are probably made of cattle rib and they're made in segments and then those segments are held together by a band that goes across them. They're called composite combs because they, they're composed of different bits of them and they're riveted together. So we've got two greys with those. We've got a few glass beads and I think some amethyst beads out of some of them. Um, but quite a lot of them have not, not anything at all. But of course that's nothing we see. That doesn't mean to say there wasn't anything in there with them. It's simply that the other materials that are made of organics, sort of textile, they could have really rich textiles or pillows or any kind, you know, furs, rugs, that kind of thing, wouldn't survive for us to see. So they're not going to really be in empty graves. It's just as nothing survives that we can see that, that came out of there. Most of the graves com contain a single individual, but we do have one grave, one quite large grave up the top end of the site there that had two individuals. Um, and I think it, it is actually the deepest grave and I think it was deliberately cut deep because they knew there were going to be two people go in there. At the bottom, there is a young adult male, so in his early 20s, and buried sometime later, not a long time later, but sometime later because there's about that much, about 20 centimetres of soil between that skeleton and the one above it, uh, was a, a, teen, a young teenager or, or you know, 11, 12, 13 year old was buried above him. A couple of other graves we've got, you can see where these people are here. They look quite long and that's because there's two graves, but they're intercutting. So, uh, and in both cases, interestingly, the second one is a child. So there was an adult in the larger one. And then at a later date, a smaller grave has been cut just down from the first grave that has got a child in it. We're nearly done now. We're on our last week here. So most of the skeletal remains are out of the grounds. Most of them are empty graves. When you go around and look, you'll see they're empty graves. But we're in the process of doing some drawing because everything has to be drawn. We excavate, we photograph everything, um, both in terms of ordinary photographs and what's called photogrammetry. We've got a chap here who's a professional photographer and he's doing photogrammetry so that it will do 3D imaging of what we found in there. And that's quite interesting when we come to looking at the double grave because we can actually show in 3D how they're related to each other. We then have to draw it. Everything gets drawn to scale um, and then it's lifted and bagged, which is what some people are doing in the background there, is lifting and bagging the, the bones in a, an orderly fashion. They will then go back to our offices in Salisbury Either myself or one of our osteoarchological team will do the analysis of the bone and they will confirm things like the age, the sex of the individual, what pathological lesions they might have. And that can tell us about the lifestyle of the individual, the diet of the individual from looking at what their teeth are like. Um, I know already there is some pathology here because we've got one broken collarbone. So that's this bone here. Um, it's broken, it's, it's, but it's healed. A bit, off, a bit off kilter, so that person either fell hard on the shoulder or maybe on an outstretched arm. And we've got another person up the top there, an older chap up the top there, who has a condition called DISH. Um, and that's short for diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. So you know where we call it DISH now, it's easier to say. But basically that's probably partly genetic, partly to do with his diet, but he made lots of bone. That's what the hyperostosis was. He made lots of bone. So he's got ossification of the soft tissue, the longitudinal ligament down his spine. So we know there's some pathology in there. Um, we'll also probably do some specialist analysis like strontium and oxygen isotope analysis which helps us work out where geologically that person was born because the strontium comes from the groundwater and it gets fixed in the tooth enamel as the teeth are developing. So you can tell whether they came from off the chalk or if they came from somewhere else. We might do carbon and nitrogen isotope analysis. That helps you work out where in what we call the trophic level somebody falls. So did they have a lot of veg vegetable diet or were they quite big meat eaters? And you can also now tell whether it was fish or red meat. So we, we do, we'll probably look at some of that as well. And with this, we're probably going to include it in a DNA programme that we're involved in, uh, which isn't for just this site, but for a whole load of Anglo-Saxon cemeteries around this. We're working with people from the Crick Institute um, and we're going to do DNA analysis to, to see 
relationships between people from different cemeteries to see how those people in different groups and different villages interacted with each other but also we'll be looking to see if there are relationships between the individuals on this site. A classic one would be the two individuals buried together in that grave. Were they related or was there something, some other form of relationship going on there? So this is just the beginning, as they say. There's an awful lot, awful lot of work yet to do when we get back into the office, um, but this is where it all starts. Even when you've finished, sometimes you find you haven't. With this one here, it had all been recorded, everything had been sorted out, and I was lifting it. And I've, as you can see, that's why it looks like there's almost nothing here. I've got all the legs out, the pelvis is out, the right arm is out. I was lifting the vertebra and the left ribs. And lo and behold, right underneath the body, well, completely hidden, is an iron knife. So that's, that's basically sat there underneath the body, pointing in that direction. It's a bit sneaky of it really because I wasn't expecting it to be there and now I've got to stop, clean it up, photograph it, draw it before I can take the rest of it out but hey that's the way things go. <laughs> For me this is, I'm, I'm kind of getting to play out because <laughs> a lot of the time now although I have done a lot of digging in the past I don't often get to go out into the field anymore. I have to spend a lot of time working on human remains in the office and advising people, etc, etc. So to come out here, and I've actually come out here over my, on my days off and over my weekends, so you can tell how good it is. This is what I get paid for doing, but I'm doing it in my spare time anyway, because it's interesting. But also, I like working with these veterans. I like working with these people because they are so interested in what they're doing. And the more you can give to them, the more they get out of it. You know, and they are interested. And I sort of explain how we do the ageing of an individual and how I work out what sex that individual was and what kind of pathology they might have. And that really helps people engage more because these were living, walking people, you know, just like we are now. They had the same fears, you know, needs, requirements, wants, desires that we have. And I think people can relate to that. And working with the veterans particularly, I find very rewarding. And it's, it's a joy to do.